This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. And I'm Sam Mercier's. And this week, we were going to have a guest, but due to technical issues, we were going to have to reschedule with her. Uh, and uh, we will have, we'll be back to normal guests, assuming nothing like that happens again. We have, we're booked for the rest of the year, so there's some good people coming up. Stay tuned. But we're going to start off today talking about the Musical America Awards, which they announced this week. The ceremony is going to happen in a few weeks. Um, the 2014 Musical America Awards. Uh, we've got uh, composer George Benjamin is the composer of the year. The conductor of the year is Pablo Era Casado. Uh, instrumentalist of the year is Jeremy Denk, our friend Jeremy Denk. Uh, and ensemble of the year is the International Contemporary Ensemble, ICE. So, hooray, new music people um, getting, getting honored by uh, Musical America. And perhaps the most annoying thing to me, and I'm not wild about the Musical America Awards. I think they're a little bit... Um, I, well, I'm not going to use any bad words on the show, but I'm not wild about them. Uh, and uh, their their musician of the year is Audra McDonald, um, which seems really strange to me for uh, Musical this America. Is a classical music publication. Right, classical music publication and, and directory and all their other things, naming kind of a jazz kind of Broadway person as their musician of the year the only real classical music that I can think of that she did in the last year was Porgy and Bess, and by all accounts, she did a great job, but... And it was, well, it was the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, too, which was a Broadway production. Right, it, which is so that's true. It's, well. not, it's not even, like, the straight-ahead Gershwin, Porgy, and Bess, right? Yeah. And we, I mean, we, it's, it's, it's true. Um, we talked about that on the show, that adaptation. Yeah, um, so you're, you're, you're forgetting something very important. What's that? She, she's really popular and she's pretty. So duh. <laughs> well, I think it's silly and dumb. She's I mean, wonderful. Think, she's a wonderful performer, but there's really no classical musician you could have honored as your classical musician of the year. Eh. Well, or or maybe they're not claiming to name a classical musician of the year, and that this is just their yeah, it, musician it's of true. the year. It's, it's just it just so music. happens that their musician of the year for the last fifty years has been a classical musician. And this time they've decided, you know, <laughs> next year it'll be Slash. Well, maybe they want to change it, spice it up. In 2000, the musician of the year was Carnegie Hall. What? In 2000, <laughs> musician of the year was Carnegie Hall. Um, so. I don't think that word means what you think it means, Musical America. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, that you know, they're willing to go out of the box a little bit to name whoever the musician yeah. of the year might be, even if it's not an actual person. Sure. Hey, and and for the record, Slash revitalized rock guitar when he with Sweet Child of Mine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> like Whatever. It was, it was all Flash and hair metal, and he put a little dirt back into the guitar sound of American rock and roll. So. Right, and some virtuosity. Um, Are you saying yeah. that Slash is the classical metal guitarist of our of that generation? No, well, and it's the thing, it's not even just, it wasn't just... Uh, I feel as if we're getting off on a tangent. Well, yes, but it wasn't <laughs> It wasn't virtuosity. It was actually, like, not virtuosity. Like, looking, instead of, like, he's playing a electric guitar cadenza, which is what, like, the guy from Poison looked like when he was playing, it looked like he was, you know, playing advanced rock blues guitar and at the stretching the limits of his technical abilities which made it have a certain sound when you say advanced rock blues guitar it makes me think of like a jamie abersall book <laughs> <laughs> um, so with, with, moving with, on well with audra i mean i i gotta say i i really do think she has an incredible voice she sings very sure. well no and we, um, we're not saying that and she's done a lot to um i think when when they did do the gershwin's porgy and bess i think what she did with um, like Stephen Colbert, I think that kind of raised the profile maybe of classical music a bit, or at least brought it into. Or at least of, of Porgy and Bess. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, I, 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 mean like, I feel in, like uh, people artistic, going. Go ahead. In artistic, so something artistic in general, I'd, I'd say. I mean, like she's a positive force sure. in the arts world. So, I mean, I think I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not upset that she's musician of the year. 
I think it's cool. dumb, but I also think the Musical America Awards are dumb in general, so whatever. There seems to not really be any criteria, and they just kind of randomly pick somebody, so I guess the why not? Do get anything? I'm sure they get a very handsome statue. Um, also this week, speaking of people giving out awards, New Music USA uh, announced the results of their first... Uh, the 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 first time through this new overhaul system that they did of of their their project grants this year they they said that through their new system that we talked about on the show last month um where it's it's web based and you can you know tag your collaborators and you can um you know bring in uh all kinds of streaming media into your application you can link to youtube videos and soundcloud streams and all kinds of cool stuff like that it was very successful they made it very easy for people to apply they said they had uh, over five thousand artists and organizations that either created a project or were tagged in someone else's project um there were 1600 submitted projects um about 845 of which were recording projects which is Exciting! I, I, I think it's going to be uh, a really, really cool year for these these grants in this new system, and uh, they're going to now be doing this twice a year. So we'll look forward to something uh, similarly exciting uh, come springtime. Uh, and it looks like we lost Nate. I hope Nate can can make it back to the show sometime. Um, Go towards the light, Nate. Um, I think it's interesting that. Uh, it's kind of not exactly clear how these numbers break down, but uh, like it lists 991 large ensemble and 449, or excuse me, 991 small ensemble, 449 large, and then it breaks it down further into categories um, like dance, jazz, electronics, but there are, according to this, 571 interdisciplinary projects, which I think is interesting. Yeah, it's um, very uh, cool. And as, as as a person who is a, a lover of the interdisciplinary thing and the word interdisciplinary, that's uh, right. I'm I'm surprised <laughs> you're not on the list, Sam. <laughs> hey, but I can type the word interdisciplinarity really fast. That's right. That's right. And and my 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 Google and my uh, uh, online or my. Uh, uh, word processing program all recognize the word interdisciplinarity. Yeah, you added those to dictionary. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but you have to really make sure that you spell them correctly before you add them. Yeah. Well, you don't want to end up looking like a fool. You might need a. Any, you guys have any other thoughts on these New Music USA grants? Um, um, well, I can't wait to see what it looks like once they get them up and running on their, you know, on the page. Yeah, because so they're cause all going to have project pages now. Yeah, some yeah, people already aspect. do have their profiles, and you can already like tag yourself if you are collab. Like, uh, like if you create a project page, you need to ask people to like kind of vouch for it with a approach. Right. So, um, like, there are like I think um, like you can go online and see that such and such an orchestra has commissioned a composer who has now created a page and says they're involved with this project. Yeah. But uh, there is, they do have a sample page of what it will look like where they work with some uh, former artists. So while they, the current projects are not up and going in a full-fledged you know, page the way it's going to be eventually, there is a sample page that we'll link to in the notes showing what it's going to look like so you can browse through the projects. So yeah, that's what I can't wait to see is after that part gets up and running to, to peruse through that. It's going to be very so, cool. So we'll we'll look forward. It's still early days for this new system, and I'm sure that even by the time they do this in March, they'll have a lot of improvements they want to make um, for the next time around. But it'll it's very cool to to see things develop there. Yeah. So why isn't why isn't Sound Notion on the new music USA Grant Gravy Train? Huh? I don't think yeah, we I don't think we qualify. I don't think we qualify. We're we're not actually an artistic endeavor. Um, what? Uh, well, we 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 have we 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 have the it's a fine line between creative something and journalism and, yeah, and pretend right. journalism. Right. We're we're mostly pretend journalists talking about it. Um, we should just so, create an amazing new work for you know this huge ensemble and then 
kind of, you know, embezzle money from that project. I think that's a way to go. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so as it turns out, the, that the Armory is not the only game in town when you want a little grouping in your diet. Right. That's pretty cool. We just talked about grouping last week and how you could watch the uh, New York Phil's grouping at the Armory on uh, Medici TV. Uh, so you can... I, is that still up? Or I guess that just came down this week. It was up until the 8th of November, I think. So it's probably not available so. anymore. But... That's okay, because you can now see another live performance of Groupin going on right here in the United States. In uh, Tonight. Patrick is our, our New Englander correspondent, resident New Englander. our resident <laughs> New Englander. So I will let him tell you all about the name of this, this institute. Well, this is, the name of this institute is the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Worcester. 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 Um, I love yeah, their thought. Uh, like like any great town from Massachusetts, you got Gloucester, Worcester, Worcester, you know. Um, but yeah, Grippen is coming to the Wor- Worcester Institute. I it's think it's going to be wicked awesome. Which which, which is going to be wicked awesome? Which has a music department? Um, it's kind of the greatest place I think to. And they don't have a music like major though, which is awesome. Yeah, is it kind of like am I does am I, MIT doesn't have a music major, right? I don't know. They don't, but I think John Harbison teaches there. Well, so that's, that's the like cool that. thing is like there are a bunch of engineers that are trying to solve this engineering problem of yes. having three orchestras and three conductors doing this massive work, which is right. They probably have like perfect. some fantastic musicians who sure. at, at at the school. They're and super I, precise. To, to put yeah, to put something like Groupin to on stage. I mean, like I would want the Worcester Polytechnic Institute to do it. <laughs> I believe it's pronounced Worcester. Worcester. Uh, I don't know. Worcester. Do you have? Can you do a, a New England accent? Yeah. Can mm. we? Can we hear no it? Doubt. <laughs> can you? Can you tell us about the Worcester Polytechnic Institute? That's all, the Worc- Worcester Polytechnic Institute is wicked awesome. <laughs> That's all you got is wicked <laughs> awesome. I don't know. What, what do you want? What else do you want to say? Uh, d- don't worry about it. We're moving on. It's over. Well, you, missed your, you missed your. You missed your moment. Don't, don't be so quiet. It's really important to the show, guys. <laughs> there, there's one thing that's interesting. They're they're pairing. If I were doing Groupin, I would feel completely fine in not programming anything else. But they're programming Academic Festival Overture with Groupin. I'm like, right. really? Good. Why? Like, why would you bother? Well, I mean, I, A, Academic Festival Overture is, I'm not a huge fan. And I'm a Brahms fan, but I'm not a fan. You're a Brahms fan, too, I was going to say. I'm not a fan of that piece, and I've played it, too, in an orchestra, and I still don't like it. But why would you bother programming anything with Groupin? That's just my Well, and, and what, when, when the New York Phil did Groupin last year, they paired it with some other kind of, like, spatial pieces. They, they did um, In Memoriam Bruna Moderna, and they did uh, Ives' yeah, Unanswered answered. Question. So some mm-hmm. like interesting pieces that deal with the physical space around the music, which is which I think a cool program idea. Um, and if we ever had a, a chamber series or something, we could have done a, a program around a similar theme. That was a joke because yeah. we did have a chamber series in Lansing, and we did a program around that theme. Uh, um, yeah. it really came across. I know, and I'm sure that was very meaningful to our audience, none of whom are in the area of Lansing, Michigan, even though right. it was a delightful concert that you all missed, likely statistically. But, um, but it's funny; it's like they're it's like they're doing this concert with Groupin, which is this crazy, you know, work still groundbreaking today. And they're but they're, in addition to that, they're also following the orchestral programming. Guidebook 101, you know. Oh, well, you got to start with an overture. So let's throw some that throw that. Out. Right, and there's the, think, and the and there's the concerto after that, and then you do the symphony as grouping afterwards, and then everyone goes out and has a nice piano noir. <laughs> you right. know, I, I with something as big as grouping on the program, I don't feel like you're going to really get all these extra mm-hmm. people to buy tickets just because you have academic festival overture on the program. Like, Griffin right. just takes well, over. Well, so what it is, I think, is this is an easy piece <clears throat> that we can throw together and make the concert slightly longer. Yeah. Right? Because, yeah. uh, well, I mean, I mean every, I, any, any, any orchestral musician could play Academic Festival over in their sleep, right? I mean, Matt Guerrieri said in the piece that, like, it's, like, possibly to entice a few conservative concert goers, but, I mean, like, I don't know. If it's Groupin, like, you can't. 
That's if you it. can't sell out group and you're doing something wrong do anything else just yeah. just group if you're not yeah i mean if you're not selling out group then you are doing a poor job of marketing why group is awesome like we need to be able to explain more clearly why group is awesome um moving on i i think i think we've said as much as we can say about group and we'll come back to spectacular performance later in the show cliffhanger da, 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 da. but before we get to that Finale is out, right? You guys are Finale users. I know, Patrick, you're a Finale user. I'm a fin- Nate, I'm a you're a Finale, finale user. user. Sam, you're. I'm the huh? only not Finale user, right? Yep. And I'm you're weird. Mac and everything. That's right. I know. It's, Where it's, are you? The, I yeah. don't understand anything. Uh, but 2014 is out a- after having you? skipped Finale 2013. After having gone to their annual update system for a long time, Finale said, "You know what?" Maybe if we worked on the software for more than one year, it would be better. And so in, in, in the interest of, of doing a much bigger update than they normally would, there was no Finale 2013. There was a new Finale that just came out for 2014. Um, so they waited so they could add more features and do some more like low-level rewriting of the code. They changed... Uh, a lot of the basic engine stuff, especially on the Mac, uh, to take advantage of of um, the Mac's full screen mode and uh, the Retina displays that are on MacBooks now, um, and that we can only imagine are coming to the Mac desktop eventually. Um, they got a, they have a new new support for uh, the new version of the Mac OS, which Sibelius does not. There are some little quirks with the new Mac OS in Sibelius Seven. Um, there's a new file format, which does not include, and, and there's no 64-bit support, which I think is weird. Sibelius 7, which is now two years old, has 64-bit support on the Mac, which means it takes better advantage of multi-core processors, um, which, which most modern computers have, right? right? Am I making stuff up? Nate, you're grinning. Yeah, right. I'm just explaining <laughs> 64-bit support. <laughs> Uh, this is re- really cool for, for people like us that write a piece and then put it on a hard drive and don't deal with it for a few years until somebody's like, hey, can I get a copy of that piece? Um, they are, they're doing better backwards compatibility for, for your files, which is really wonderful if, you ever needed, if, if you've ever tried to open an old file in a current version of, of... I mean, I know people that keep like eight back versions of Finale and Sibelius on their computers just because... If they ever need to open one of those old scores and edit something, they can do it. Um, right. So they're they're working on better backwards compatibility and even forwards compatibility, which, which I think is, is quite a promise. Yeah. Because who knows what the next version is gonna do? That's that, like that's like forwards time travel. I know, right? That's right. It's, <laughs> can't do it. You can't do it. Right. Here's the interesting feature to me. I'm doing um, forward time travel right now at a rate of one second per second. <laughs> Holy cow. Yes. Boom. Um, co- composing and arranging time savers. Exclusive idea generating features. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Essential tools like transposition and range checking. In so other anybody words, Anybody can like, be a composer. Well, Sebastian yeah. has had stuff like that for a while, and I always thought, like, well, just know had what stuff you're doing. Like that too. Finale's had stuff like that, too, but... It, well, I mean, I think I don't remember what version I'm using, but sometimes it does weird, strange, like it chops your music up and makes it irrational. Right. But um, sometimes it would work and do something. But like you know, generate canon and all that. I've never really used that stuff, but it's it's interesting to me that they have this stuff in there. And I would like because they supposedly now it's new and improved, and I want to see how that works. You know. They have some new tools for multi voice multi-voices yeah. on a single staff, which I think are going to be really helpful and save people a lot of time in editing, yeah. uh, where mm-hmm. it'll push rests together if there are multiple layers, or uh, it deals with the accidentals uh, in the same spaces different, uh, better. So that'll, be, that'll save a lot of time in, in the editing step. Um, there are, finally, finally, we have open keys. You can have an atonal key as, as your key signature, and you don't have to go through <laughs> and set each instrument as a non- key signature instrument oh, that's very good which is was super tedious in old versions of finale um yep. the so th- there's 
a lot of some new features regarding um, linked parts. You can now do some more independent stuff in linked parts that don't necessarily have to reflect back to the score, um, which is really nice. And so they're doing a lot of really nice things. And it is available now, and it is priced more like Sibelius. To buy a new copy of Finale 2014 is now $600, just like Sibelius. Um, so it, the price is it, going up, but the upgrade is more uh, um, substantial. So I'm, yeah. I'm curious to see well, what the, it says they're including more resources under educator tools. Which to me, that's a, a very could be a very very useful feature because when you want to whip out a worksheet or something, mm -hmm. it'd be nice to have some template that pops up where you know it's easy to do something like that. Um, I don't know what they're going to be, but like if you could say, I want this exercise done and formatted neatly in all twelve keys or something like that, and have it just go boom after you enter it one time, you know, instead of having to go in and manually transpose and blah blah blah. Yeah, that's one one. It's related to a thing that I read in one of the articles about the upgrade is that uh, the Sibelius has been doing a really really nice job of having everything just not collide and and lay nicely on a page. And finally, this new version is do a lot better job with that as well. So hopefully, we'll find it to be good. Yeah, so yeah. It, that, that'll be nice. In response to this, uh, which was kind of a surprise thing. Um, there were some leaks of it, of Finale 2014, uh, and then Finale said, you know what, let's just release it, because it's done, right? Um, but Sibelius, <laughs> Avid coming back from Sibelius, has announced, and this is usually the year that we would expect a Sibelius update. It's been two years since the last Sibelius update. Sibelius 8 came out um, in, like, a, like, it's a little over two years now. So it was around March or April, I think of 2011 and now we're at the end of 2013 and we're still waiting for Sibelius 8 uh and part of that i would imagine is is because of the the complete turnover in the development staff uh that they got rid of the the london developers for Sibelius and are now transitioning to their new uh eastern european development center and their los angeles development center just like the rest of avid's product line um, Do you think that translates into maybe losing some customers because they the releases don't match up for the same years? What do you um, mean? Like, I think part of the strategy between things like uh, Xbox and PS4 is that they release at the same time so that they can kind of, like, their own... Like, people who like Xbox can stay with Xbox. People who like PS4 stay with PS4. But if, like, there's only one option one year and it's time for you to upgrade then you might just go with what's available. Well, I don't know. I think there's a lot of uh, file format lock-in. I think it's a, a lot harder to switch between these two things than it is to switch between uh, uh, game consoles. And also, I would point out that in the last generation, or I guess I should say the current generation, because the new ones aren't out yet, but in the current generation, Xbox 360 was out for a year before PlayStation 3. Oh, yeah. Um, Maybe and PlayStation just 3 came out the same year as the Wii, and the Wii kind of, like, exploded and then collapsed and now nintendo's newest console the wii u has been out for over a year now and nobody's right. buying it because it's terrible so um uh, i think if you have that. a good the, the moral of the story is if you have a good thing people are going to buy it and it doesn't matter when it comes out if it's good and people know about it they'll buy it um and and i think <coughs> it seems like finale 2014 is is pretty good sibelius has come back with uh an announcement that they are going to have kind of like a a mini update thing that's going to add a lot of features to Sibelius 7. Um, this was reported by the Sibelius blog's Philip Rothman, who uh, Sibelius blog is, is an independent blog, I should say. They are not affiliated with Avid. Um, said that he has gotten uh, in touch with Avid's Bobby Lombardi, who says that, that we should expect sometime soon a Sibelius 7.5 which will be kind of an interim thing between Sibelius 7 and Sibelius 8 that will add some features and maybe fix some bugs. I hope that it's going to fix this bug in the new Mac OS uh, with the way fonts are, are rendered. Uh, it's not, it doesn't affect the scores. It affects the way the fonts are rendered in um, the, the dialog boxes in, in the, the program interface. Uh. But it still doesn't look great. So... Uh, it, We'll see if we get an interesting update to Sibelius that 
can match some of these features. A lot of these features that are announced in this new Finale 2014 are things that Sibelius has had for a while, and Finale's annual upgrade cycle has not allowed them to to do any of these really big features mm-hmm. um, that take more than a year to develop. So it's very cool. I'm, I'm happy to see Finale going to this cycle because I think it makes a lot more sense for this kind of really powerful software. Right. Um, it's it's the kind of thing that that Adobe would do with with their Creative Suite, and now Adobe has even moved. And I wonder if we'll ever see this. Adobe has moved to the cloud for a lot of their stuff, and now you subscribe to Adobe Creative Suite. And Microsoft has done this with Microsoft Office, and you subscribe to these things, and you just get whatever updates are available whenever they're available. Um, and, and as long as your subscription is current, you'll always have the most recent version, which is, I think, an interesting, um, an interesting paradigm for professional mm-hmm. software. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I wonder what the, what the cost would be for this kind of subscription for these kinds of software. And, and, and if it ever comes to pass that we have to subscribe to Finale and Sibelius, I think a lot of people are going to have to make some tough choices about right. whether that's worth it to them. Yeah, uh, I know some people. Some people who've been around for a while. Composers who write a lot who still use well, like Finale two thousand two. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no, I mean we we edit the show in uh, or I edit the show in Adobe Premiere Pro from CS five, which is now like four years old, and it works fine. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. I, I just can't yeah. wait to see what the response to the newest version of Finale is because, you know, Finale users tend to be uh, kind of like feel they feel about it the way Churchill felt about democracy. It's the worst system in the world except for everything else, you know. That's people <laughs> tend to think. Well, it's also I hate Finale except everything else is not as good as Finale. I think it's dangerous anytime that you're doing a big update to soft professional software that people rely on to do their jobs and that people have spent decades learning to use. We saw this with with Windows 8. When Windows 8 came out and it completely changed the interface for Windows, a lot of people were very upset because they had spent the last, you know, two decades learning how to use Windows the way it was, starting with Windows 95, learning to use that kind of interface. Um, And now there's a new thing that's seemingly completely unrelated to this thing that they've spent the last two decades learning to use, and and now we're going to have to learn this new one, and we'll we'll eventually, I'm sure, get used to it, and then two decades from now they'll change it again, and we'll have to learn that thing. It's 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 frustrating when it happens, and features that you rely on get taken out or get implemented in a different way, or things get buried or other things get surfaced, and it's it's there's always going to be some growing pains, but I think it's exciting when things get updated any time. But that's just me. Okay, so I know it's almost time for the deep cut, but I'm calling an audible here. You don't want um, to talk about Yeezus? Oh, okay. Yeah, we have yeah. to talk yeah. about Yeezus. You gonna, what's yeah. your audible? Do you want to call that. it How before? How can you forget about Kanye? I well, yeah, we got Kanye. We, we haven't talked about Kanye enough on the show in the last uh, three years, and I think it's high time that we if corrected I, that. I call him... If I call an audible on Kanye, he'll run into my office and yank the microphone. I'm gonna let you finish, Sam. <laughs> I'm a, <laughs> I'm gonna let you. Finish. I'm gonna let you finish, but uh, I just want you to know that we can all learn something from Jesus. Nat Evans uh, on on New Music Box had a, had a post this week about things that we in the classical music community and the new music community can learn about Jesus based on Kanye's stage show of Yeezus, his tour for, for Yeezus, which is his new album that came out this summer, um, to, I'm going to say mixed reviews. Uh, the, uh, if you've heard it, you know that the, the music, the, the production is great and really interesting. The lyrics are awful. Um, famously Mm -hmm. awful sitting in a French ass restaurant. Hurry up with my damn croissants is a rhyme. (laughs) From this album, <laughs> so I'll let that sink in. Hey, if, if Bob Dylan can use Siamese yeah, nice. hat in order to form a rhyme with diplomat, I think we could forgive uh, Kanye for that one. They're just—it's just not good. It, the the lyrics are just bad. Just deal with it. <laughs> 
<laughs> but the, the the production is great. The the sounds are wonderful. Um, and uh, anyway, this this stage show is this amazing stadium scale performance piece. Uh, as Nat Evans describes it. Uh, and he encourages you to search on social networks for hashtag Yeezus or hashtag Yeezus tour to see some of these photos. But there's crazy projection stuff and crazy set design stuff and pretty adventurous costume design things. Um, you, you've got costumes, uh, these these famous um, couture mask things from uh, Maison Martin Margella, who does these like full cover your face and head mask things that are covered in these jewels and multifaceted glass pieces and they're really strange Mm -hmm. and people accept it from Kanye and they accept it in this outlandish stage show that's way over the top and you've got things that look very he, he compares it to Nat Evans is, compares it to Wagner some of the, the the stranger things we've seen in Wagner productions and in fact someone who has worked on Kanye's sets before uh, S. Devlin is a European opera set designer who has done a, a fair amount of Wagner in the past and this is all very aesthetically challenging and uh, Evan's conclusion from this this piece is perhaps, quote, perhaps we just need to admit to ourselves that people like to be challenged, that people want to dive in to a wild and, and contemporary imagery and messages, but that our success in that mission may not come from our own backyard. So he is suggesting that these wild interdisciplinary projects are something that people really can get behind. What do you guys think? I mean, Sam, um, we talked well, about your love of the interdisciplinarity ness <laughs> esque. Sam, what's up? Um, I would I would say that noting that people accept this show from Kanye ignores the fact that Kanye is hugely popular and has a, a very devoted fan base. Um, that you think they are wouldn't accept it if it were, if you were nobody. I think if it was just some rapper guy giving a concert and he did it this way, I don't think people would be as willing to embrace it as they are from Kanye. I don't know if there's a way to do this show at a small if budget not- that some some rapper guy would be able to do. I think it's yeah. got to be a huge production from Kanye. The only way that you can afford that huge production is if you are Kanye. Well, that was going to be my next point. And, you know... Talking about doing something on this scale take, takes money, and that's not something that new music people typically have. Sure. So maybe maybe the, the lesson is try and make it as wild and crazy as you can, but you have to be extra creative if you're doing it on a budget. Mm-hmm. I mean, so doing doing crazy multimedia things on a budget is is uh, when I think of that, I think of my friend Nate Plyton. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I and I think of a lot of the stuff like where. Kanye, with his amazing resources and all the people behind him, can do this crazy layer of things, but like fundamentally it's gotta be super polished to work this way. And like right. and, and so that's a thing where like in my experience, I usually get like eighty percent or so in terms of just like coming up or having the idea, using all the resources and sharing the responsibility with people and then like Soft and teeny, teeny little quirks, but and and in in the music world, like it's it's hard to spend that much time and like I so what what I would love to see and what I kind of take away from this is like seeing new, more new music people taking cues from the theater world and just like the timeline of putting productions together like this because you know they've got to have. What do you mean the, if, the timeline of putting the project together? Like, for a production like what Kanye has with this, there's uh, l- layers and layers of people, different stage managers, technical directors, and, and crew, and just an amazing force of people that all have their, ro- their roles and their timeline going together <laughs> to put this, this kind of production together. Where Kanye might be, like, interacting on an artistic level, but he's also just, like, 
they're singing and there's people to take care of all of these other things. And that's the thing that in addition in the new music world, like I, uh, I don't know if like financial resources might be a thing, but just the, the number of people and the roles and everybody covering everything. That's another thing that's tough to get. Well, this seems to me like what we're kind of talking about is opera. Yeah, exactly. Right. This is this is a very operatic production that we're talking about, and we're even comparing it to a, an opera designer, production designer from opera. Well, is, is mean, there a place for operaticness without singing? Can we do something like this in instrumental music, or does it require? There's something that's inherently charismatic um, about singing. I think. Like looking out at the audience and using your voice, a thing that they also have to say things to them in in song, that is a barrier to instrumentalists. I, instrumentalists don't have that immediate connection with the audience because they're holding this magical machine that's in between them. That's the thing that's making the sounds that most of the people in the audience do not have the machine nor the wherewithal to use it. Had they the machine? So I, I wonder if the acceptance of this outlandishness requires that connection that only a singer is ever really going to get. Does that make sense? Am I I'm, talking out of I my butt? I hear what you're saying with the instrument barrier kind of thing with having, <laughs> having this object that isn't like you acting a part it, like in order like to do a theatrical production like would you wrap your violin in these jewel studded mask kind of things or like how how do you bring that instrument into this kind of imagery kind of and and i i'm reminded of or like however i'm reminded of alarm will sound in some of the productions that uh they've done i've only seen video but they seem to have been thinking this way for a while of how to bring the instrumentalists out and connect with the audience in a more theatrical way and uh yeah, like memorizing their music, p playing in different uh, places in the house and doing different things with lights and stuff. Right. Um, and when I see those Dave, things, I, think I do think of opera. Yeah. Sam? Dave, oh. I, think you're, I think you're right, but uh, the connection that you're talking about, how people feel a connection to the human voice, I, I think that connection is really strong for Kanye. But when you have somebody come out and start singing bel canto style singing, connection for quote average audiences is not as strong not nearly as strong because they still i think that type of singing still isolates people from feeling a strong connection because it still it feels like an instrument that they don't have when that's they true that kind of thing. that's true i agree yeah. no and, and i would say that that's there whether or not you have this surrounding thing right if if you're either giving a voice recital or giving a clarinet recital there's still that difference between that the relationship between the performer and the audience and mm -hmm. that's just up to the performer to figure out how to solve that problem and that's that's the thing that we practice trying to do right is is trying to to overcome the clarinet barrier or the piano barrier or the violin barrier or the trombone barrier right well talking yeah. about i just wanted to bring up when you were bringing up production design earlier um if you remember there was a lot of buzz around this shock cousin piece that premiered at or that had its like i think u.s premiere at lincoln center this past summer mm -hmm. um it was sorry michael's risa um dierda um and then you can see some pictures of it of like the a trumpeter in this encased in this metal tube i put the link in the doc if you want to see the picture um you can show oh. it on the sh on the feed yeah um but it's kind of inc that's not an opera but it has like this incredible production value, which we've seen a lot. Actually, we've seen a lot from people like um, Michelle Van Der too. Oh yeah, Zipply. absolutely. His 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 uh, cello piece, and mm -hmm. and you know, uh, speaking of of Stockhausen again, we we just a few months ago were talking about the premiere of Mitwach aus Licht, the right. the the piece that includes the helicopter string quartet. So, I mean, these are pretty outlandish things, but I think the difference is that 
there's still something that prevents these from having the same audience that Kanye has. And I don't, what, what is the difference if not the musical aesthetic? I mean, I, mean, I feel um, like the other parts of the aesthetic are not that different. It's, it's sensational. Um, but so is this. Take a look at the what the audience is doing in a Kanye West concert and what the audience is doing in the stock concert and in a group in concert or something like that. I mean, like it's yeah. this is this is the thing this is the thing that we've talked about a number of times with like. So you're saying that the difference that, between, that at Kanye concerts people don't sit quietly and yes, hand, actually, I am in their laps. Yeah, the format's different, engaged in a different way. Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, like that's why I mean. The it's it's such a different experience with with other kinds of art too. Like when you're at a when you can talk to your friend when you're looking at visual art, or um, mm-hmm. you know you can't do that in music. You can never do that. Maybe in Nuxuit, maybe you can do that. Well, you can, but it starts becoming not art music if it's a kind of music that allows you to get up and dance and talk to your friends. You know, if if our goal, if like my goal, is to make art music, music that makes you want to sit and like. Make, let your ears do the main part of the work. I really want you to hear the complexity of what's going on. And if it's a production that encourages talking and dancing and and um, not paying as close attention to the specifics of the music, then it starts becoming not art music to me. Yeah, yeah th- you're right. And that's I think that's a, a concern that we always have when we're talking about um, outreach is that Yes, we need to change the way we present the music, and maybe we even need to change the music that we're presenting. But there's a point at which we have we shift away from being art music to being popular music, and I don't think that's the solution either. Because the thing that we're do we want to make the thing that we do popular and comfortable, but not at the expense of whatever we consider that the essence of that thing. And right. I think one of the problems is that we all identify different parts of art music as the the essential parts of it, right? Mm. The thing that somebody else wants yeah. to change is, is going to, to, to make it a different thing to me, and the things that I want to change is going to make it a different thing to somebody else. So maybe wanted, we... Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to clarify that Michael's Frizum Dierda is an operatic excerpt from Donnerstag <laughs> Auslicht. Well, I just, I just I I just wanted to get the facts straight right there. I'm yeah. glad we got that. So the fact up. checkers don't get us. Right. Factcheck.org. You've been served. <laughs> now, Sam, you're you audible. Well, we we end up talking on the show uh unsurprisingly a lot about media and media saturation and the way new media works and the effect it has on the way people absorb music and the way they consume music and the way they purchase music. And I think don't think you can be involved in the music world and not be, at least in some way, especially new music, and not be in some way concerned about the way technology has affected the way people perceive, use, and distribute music. And this week... A person very much involved in that world, not music specifically, but in that world, Clifford Nass, um, who did lots of research about um, the way modern media technology has affected the human condition. Um, basically, uh, one of the biggest things is that uh, pointed out that people talk about multitasking and how modern technology helps them do that, but proved through a big study that people that claim that are really bad at multitasking um, mm. died this week at only 55. So mm. somebody who had a lot to say about the current state of affairs involving technology, a technology that's very intimately related, at least for me to the music world has passed away. Mm. Yes. That's very sad. sad. Especially like you said, he was so young. He could have done so much more. Amazing research, though his his research that he did, I think, is, has inspired a lot of other people to um, go down that path. Uh, I'm is, sure if he if he'd not passed away, he would have solved the internet. Sure. <laughs> is it time for our deep cut? I think, I think it's it time. is. Our deep. Uh, what? Wait, Sam has to do something. Sam, no, say it. I don't have. I don't have it. There's not a I deep cut. Have, There's oh, not a deep cut have, available. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, the deep cut is. Patrick's suggestion. I had not seen this thing, 
So, Patrick, I will let you attempt to describe <laughs> what this is. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Of footage of old Buster Keaton film uh, and put it all together, mash it together, create this this uh, this movie set to the music of John Adams' Fearful Symmetries, an orchestral work from 1988. Um, as far as the music goes, um, you can definitely tell the influence of Nixon in China. There's saxophone in it. It's got a kind of bombastic, um, you know, rhythmic vitality to it. And, um, yeah, it's like, it, it's just a funny video. <laughs> I yeah. don't know what else to say. I no, love, I love watching Buster Keaton footage to John Adams music. It's just so, uh, so strange, but seeming it's, it's a little bit. It's a, it's a it's it's a little bit like Koyana Scotzi, but with Buster Keaton, <laughs> which is a great idea. Somebody should do that same thing with Koyana Scotzi and replace all of the footage of Koyana Scotzi with with Buster Keaton. Oh man, I just I just <laughs> invented I, I a thing. I would rather have somebody sort of. replace the music with something else. Yeah, well that too. No, I have no comment on the on the on the matter of Philip Glass's music. But here's our pick of the week. This is John Adams' Fearful Symmetries uh, mashed up with Buster Keaton stuff. It's pretty good. And that's all you're going to get of that, sorry, but it's very cool, and we'll have a link in our show notes where you can check out the rest of it, um, because like, like we said, it, it just is so perfect. Um, to, it's perfect music for the montage. It's, it's strangely perfect. I don't understand why it works. Um, <laughs> I don't know either. I think that music, I mean, a lot of John Adams' music, you could take any kind of human activity and show it in fast forward, <laughs> and, and it would look appropriate with John Adams' music. <laughs> <laughs> just got this you know what, next time benny hill though sure <laughs> and we'll yeah. yakety sax replace is yakety sax <laughs> with That's john true, though, but like yakety sax show anybody doing anything in fast forward and yakety sax sounds perfect yeah totally um so that's gonna do it for this week's show uh sorry we didn't have a guest this week but we gave you some really awesome stuff i think and you should definitely check out some of these stories they're certainly worth your while and we'll have links to all of them on our site soundnotion.tv slash sn who's on the schedule for next week somebody, um, somebody check pianist, that pianist alec uh, I don't quite know if I can get his name right. <laughs> that is bad. Hold on. Let's see. Way to go, Sam. Carrick. Alex Carrick. I'm pretty sure. Hold on. He's a piano player who has a new release coming out that's all new music. Or not all new music, but all new in the, the generic uh, classification, not as in brand new composed music. Um, Alex, Alex Carris. Car- Alec Carris. Um, has a new, uh, got a lot of some Morton Feldman music and other things. And he did a show recently, or he's going to do a show recently that's all Morton Feldman music. Um, so, you know, grab a comfortable chair if you're going to one of those concerts. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk about that because I'm sure he's had, if he's doing some Morton Feldman music, he's, he's been sitting on the bench for hours and hours and hours at a stretch. So right. that'll be an interesting bring, chat. Bring a comfortable chair if you're going to practice it too. Yeah. I'm sure... I'm sure there's there's a lot of uh, practice room time to do any of that stuff. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, join us, we do the show live on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. ish Eastern time. We're usually much more punctual than we are when we have a guest. Um, so join us at soundnotion.tv slash live. If you have any questions about preparing any of that crazy music for our guest, jump in chat and we'll pass your questions along next week. 
And uh, we appreciate everyone who joined us this week in chat. Thank you very much. If you are watching this after the fact, that's cool too. You can leave a comment for us on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Follow us, like us, subscribe to us. And we will, we will love to continue these conversations with you in those places. Uh, if you'd like to suggest a story or a topic for Sound Notion, just tweet us with hashtag SN Weekly, and we always check that out as we're preparing the show each week. You can subscribe to this show and all our shows in the iTunes store. We're going to be launching a new show very soon. Uh, Patch In with Nate Blyton and Ben Furman is going to be about electronic music. So Ooh. look for that in the iTunes store and other places. Um, and uh, we, we would love to, uh, to, to see you joining us there as well. We also just released an episode of uh, our film music show, Streamers and Punches, this week. So check that out, too. If you'd like to support us, you can use our Amazon search box when you're doing your holiday shopping and buying things on Amazon. Because who doesn't buy everything on Amazon? I buy everything on Amazon. I, 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 I assume you guys do, too, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So Gluten you should use our search box. Quick. It's on the right side of the page, and just search there. It doesn't cost you anything, but we get a little commission, and that helps us out a lot. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Left. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you back next week.